Our next speaker is Dr. Anne McCormick. Dr. McCormick is a staff specialist in the Department of Endocrinology at St. Vincent's Hospital and is conjoint lecturer at the University of New South Wales. In addition, she is the group leader of the Hormones and Cancer Group here within Garvin. Her primary interests, research interests are in pituitary tumour genetics and investigation of the hormonal mechanics driving the increased risk of cancer associated with obesity and diabetes. Please welcome a mic'd up Dr. Anne McCormack. Thank you. Can we hear? Anyway, let me know if you need more sound. Okay. Um, so I'm Anne McCormack. Um, I'm at heart a clinical endocrinologist. Um, some of you may have come across um, people like myself. Um, we deal a lot with diabetes, thyroid disease, pituitary disease and osteoporosis. Um, I have a special interest in pituitary tumours and uh, endocrine tumours in particular and uh, familial causes of those. So what I thought I'd do today is rather than talk about cancer genomics and the future of that, which I really think has been touched upon by Marcel and John Maddock, um, is to really tell you some tales from my own clinical practice that has fed into my research, which is implied in, in that slide. Right, so in this talk, I'd like to give you an, an overview and a breadth, show you the breadth of genetics in endocrine disease. To touch upon the current standard practice of genetic testing that's available in Australia for endocrinology and its major limitations. And then to you know, delve into genomics and as I said, a new era for endocrinology. And I'm really excited to be part of the, the, the front running, um, uh, I guess, physicians who are embracing this new um, technology and opportunity, and I'll delve into some of the opportunities and then to touch upon and give a little bit of a realistic arm to this about some of the limitations that we're currently coming across. Right, so all these patients are patients of mine and they're patients that are likely to have an underlying genetic abnormality. We've got a lady who's got primary hyperparathyroidism, which is a, um, a tumour that's secreting too much PTH that gives high calcium levels. She has a father, sorry, it hasn't come out quite well enough, but a father who died of a pancreatic malignancy who also had primary hyperparathyroidism. We have a lady who's a little bit older who has primary hyperparathyroidism and a pituitary tumour. We have a father and son. The father presented initially with a pituitary tumour, then developed hyperparathyroidism. Around the same time, the son presented with hyperparathyroidism. Both later developed thyroid cancer. The father died of the thyroid cancer and both also had adrenal tumours. So we have a mother and three daughters here who have primary hyperparathyroidism without other um, endocrine tumours that were apparent. So in all of these patients to us, we would say, right, well, the first gene to look for is MEN1, which is a multiple endocrine um, neoplasia gene. And so traditionally, we would send it away mostly to Brisbane to get tested at a cost of about $400 for one gene. Now, um, most of the time that bill is forked out by the hospital sometimes the patients pay for that themselves. So essentially that gene, that test might take anywhere from four to eight weeks to come back to us. In the first case, bang on the head, we got it right, MEN1 positive. In the um, patient on the, your right, um, turned out to be MEN1 negative. Now we know traditionally that 10% of these absolutely typical MEN1 patients um, that clinically have the disease and would fulfill the criteria are negative. We presume there's other genes that we don't know about yet that look the same, but we've got no way of knowing what that is at the moment, so they sit undiagnosed. The patient down, the, the father and son were thought to have MN1 disease, and once it was tested, um, unfortunately it was negative, so they sat and, and, and waited. Then the, pa the father developed a big goiter with some thyroid nodules, and essentially at that time, eventually a biopsy got done, Unfortunately, it was all too late and he had metastatic medullary thyroid cancer. And then it tweaked that, well, actually this could now be MEN2, was tested in, again, one gene way and found to be MEN2 positive. The, the son then went on and had all the tests and we actually got the son early enough. But if we'd known and been able to test for that MEN2 earlier in the process, we would have saved the, the father's life. Now, the third, uh, fourth, third family, fourth family, um, also MEN1 negative. Now, in fact, with this family, there are a whole host of genes that could be involved, and we sent them around the country in various places to be tested. Over a period of about six months, we got MEN1 negative, MEN2 negative, HRPT2 negative, 
and I'm still waiting on the calcium sensing receptor, which is now 18 months later. So I still don't have an answer in that family. This is a patient I look after from the Solomon Islands who's 25 when he came to us unfortunately too late with gigantism due to a massive growth hormone secreting tumour. Basically this has totally wiped out his life. Um, he was um, incapacitated with a visual field deficit, uncontrolled diabetes, severe neuropathy, um, walking with a stick and really unable to play basketball, which was his number one love, obviously, because of his height. Now, he had no family history of pituitary, pituitary tumours, um, but he did have a brother that was very tall, as well as a father and a nephew who were very tall. Um, and that's interesting. So basically, the Fiji Times had already cottoned on that this guy may have something underlying it, and it said, genetics has a supreme hand in his case. Um, the patient has a family history of very tall men. His great-grandfather was also as tall, and some before him were taller. So there was a sense that there was something going on here. And in fact, when I saw him at that time, we started to begin to understand that there was a new gene called AIP, um, which was involved in these, often in these families with gigantism and other pituitary tumours. So we sent his blood off to Belgium at the time. That was the only place that was being tested. And sure enough, we found an AIP germline mutation. And I suppose now the interesting thing is I'm trying to screen his family remotely from the Solomon Islands. We have um, the father died young, but essentially he has a sister, two sisters, a brother and a nephew who all carry the mutation, who are all tall, um, essentially, but no parent pituitary tumours that I can tell from remotely. Um, so it's a very interesting story that's underway now and probably the history of tall men is actually based on truth. So from the patient, this is all very interesting. From the patient perspective, though, my patients always want to know, well, is there a genetic cause? People are very interested to understand what's going on. Are there other medical problems that I could face if I do have that? Does it run in the family? People are very concerned about whether this could run in the family. So there are really important issues here. Now, fam familial pituitary tumour syndromes. The brothers here pictured in about 1880, the Shields brothers, known as the Texas Giants, they clearly have something running in the family. Four of them very, very tall and um, have a growth hormone secreting tumour. So there's clearly something in the family. We now know that most of these sorts of patients carry an ARP mutation, but we now know that there are, up, there are eight genes involved in pituitary tumour, familial pituitary susceptibility and there are probably a heap of other ones we don't know yet. So what we've done here with the capability of Marcel collaborating with Marcel is to develop a gene panel now. So instead of sending the blood round to Belgium or over to um, Brisbane and waiting months and months, we can test them all in one hit. Now we also got interested in seeing, well, seeing as we can put eight genes on the panel, maybe we should just fill up the panel with a whole lot of other genes and decide whether we can you know, have a best guess about what other genes are. So we filled up the panel. We used some cancer genes as well in there. We thought we might be able to roll it out to other cancer groups. And now we, this is literally two weeks old, some of this data. So we're really trying to understand it. But essentially what I've got, this is the first 12 patients that we ran through this. And what I wanted to highlight here, which I find very, very interesting, is that um, this patient down the, this one here is a lady also with gigantism who's crippled with gigantism in a wheelchair. And again, we've got an ARP mutation, no surprise. This patient was totally unexpected. This is a 31 year old male with a, not with a prolactinoma, so not a different type of tumour in the pituitary, but he was found to have an ARP mutation. But lo and behold, he also carries MEN1 positive, uh, a, a suggestible MEN1 positive uh, mutation. Not, we haven't clarified whether it, it's definitely a mutation. However, I think he does because when I looked at his family history, which we've got all our patients to fill in very, very um, religiously. In fact, he told me in clinic he didn't have a family history of any, any endocrine tumours. But when he went away and asked his family more directly about it and produced a lovely list, his dad actually had primary hyperparathyroidism. So there's two genes here in one patient. Now normally we would have potentially not even analysed him because he wasn't really singing to have an endocrine tumour. But if we did and we had the family history of the um, father, we would have done MEN1, but we wouldn't have looked at ARP because we would have stopped there and just said it's MEN1 disease. So we have, by doing the gene panel, two now interacting genes. So I think that's really important. We've also got two here, which we're trying to figure out whether they're pathogenic or not. And interestingly then, all these other rare variants popped up, really unusual genetic issues in some of the other genes that we put on the panel, which we're now trying to dissect out what they mean. <laughs> um, and that's interesting. One of them potentially has a, a breast cancer gene here. So there are a whole lot of information there that we're trying to understand. Now, um, 
So targeted gene panels really have a role and are the future of routine endocrine testing. We know that patients who are susceptible to um, para, sorry, who have pheochromocytoma paragangliomas, which are adrenaline type um, endocrine tumors, essentially now we know there are a whole heap of genes involved in, in those. And so again, a panel is the best approach to, to those patients. Similarly, diabetes, we know there are certain families that diabetes runs incredibly strong in those families. And again, we know there's a whole heap of genes. So gene, gene panels makes a lot of sense. But we also get excited. We've got the potential to do some discovery things here. So this is a very interesting family. I look after a father and a daughter. The father had a prolactinoma at the age of 16. And interestingly, he couldn't actually conceive normally. I don't think that's relevant, but we gave him some drugs in order to help um, be able to have a, a child. And his daughter ended up with congenital growth hormone deficiency, not a tumor, but another abnormality in the pituitary. Um, this is another family here whose um, father's got metastatic neuroendocrine carcinoma, mother with hyperparathyroidism pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and the daughter came to me with a pituitary tumour. Um, now, this is my most interesting one recently. Um, I don't know what you see in that picture there. Male, female, do you see candlestick? Very interesting. So this poor lady came to me about her bones. But in fact, in the history, she apparently, to me, um, had an abnormality of sexual development, possibly, in that she didn't have a period. She had some street gonads. And in fact, when we karyotyped her, she is an XY female. So that's a male, as genetically a male, but actually a female. Now, there are a whole heap of not really well understood genes here. And so what we're going to do is a whole genome sequence, probably in her, um, to try and understand the genetic basis of what's going on there. Um, and so basically, we can do more wider genetic testing using some of these other things that Marcel has, has already touched upon. Now, I just wanted to bring here a realistic, this, patient, this family almost certainly have a genetic abnormality here and quite serious disease, but the, the um, daughter does not want to go anywhere near genetic testing. She's got concerns about insurance, won't, won't even do it. So that's a realistic um, stop guard, I suppose, to doing a lot of this, which I think as a society we need to really address. Now, here is the, fam the, the interesting one, and he was actually on the panel that we looked at, and we've got, we started, because he was they were the most interesting to us initially, to look at some of those other rare variants, and in fact, what seems to us to be a possible new gene that we're looking at for, for this sort of um, predisposition is a FGFR1 mutation, which has been described in one other case in the world. So what we're looking at here is really exciting new stuff. Now, what I've also done, is um, try to, again, this idea about repurposing existing drugs. So generally speaking, pituitary disease, pituitary tumours aren't really well, I, you know, don't really have a voice, I suppose, in, in, in a lot of this. This gentleman here is, is dying of his um, pituitary tumour. He's had five surgeries, two courses of radiotherapy, chemotherapy that hasn't quite worked. And we're really desperate for new treatments for this guy who's a very highly, was a highly functioning IT consultant, a father of two young children. Now, what we did is we ran his, we looked at the expression of a whole lot of his genes on a panel. And at the time, one case report about the use of this drug bevacizumab in, that's used in lung and breast and a couple of other conditions routinely, we um, ha potentially could have access to it here in Australia. Um, and we looked at this particular gene, wondering whether, I wondered whether or not, um, because one case, in an aggressive pituitary tumor respond to it, to, responded to it, so I wondered about it. We looked at it. He does have expression of VEGFA on his panel, which means that potentially this drug could work. I then approached the company about supplying it, and they said it was going to basically, they weren't really interested, particularly in supplying it at a low cost. Um, we're still trying to figure out what to do. So essentially, I then approached the hospital. The hospital said, well, it's going to cost, basically, it was going to cost $100,000 per year. Um, the hospital can't afford that for one patient. The pharma company won't supply it essentially free of charge. We've got no way. It's not PBS listed. So even we have this information, we're now stalled by the treatment cost and the pharmaceutical industry. And, and it's really, I think, as a clinician, is a big issue we need to overcome. Right, so basically treatment costs is inhibiting us doing that. So this is just to finish um, because we touched upon, you know, finding out the interesting stuff about family, um, tracing family and, and your inheritance and all the rest of it. And this is, a, I find, a very fascinating story about pituitary tumours and the ARP story, which I've touched upon with the giants, etc., that I've, that I've touched on. 
This is a story about Charles Byrne, who was an Irish giant, lived in the 17th century, and his family came from Northeast Ireland. And he was 2.31 metres tall, seven foot seven inches. Um, he, as a lot of them are, we've had Sultan, I can't remember his surname, come out recently to Australia, appeared on Sunrise, who was the tall guy, who's the tallest man in the world currently. He also has a gross hormone secreting tumour. And obviously people are very interested in, in these people. So he was exhibited around London, was you know the freak of, of circus shows. And obviously when he died, people really wanted to um, have his bones. It was a prize. So people actually uncovered his bones and put him into the Hunterian Museum for exhibit in London. Um, then um, Harvey Cushing, who's the, um, really the grandfather of pituitary medicine, um, was a famous neurosurgeon, was travelling around London in the early 1900s and said, right, I'm going to the Hunterian Museum. I've heard about this, this guy. I'm sure he's probably got a pituitary tumour. That's what he thought at the time. So he went and had a look at the skull and lo and behold, on the right is the skull of um, Charles Byrne compared to a normal and basically there's evidence in the skull that he had a pituitary tumour. So he concluded that that was in fact the case. So now we fast forward to 2010. We've got four Northern Irish families who now, because of the knowledge about AIP mutation, had been tested and found to have the same sort of mutation. Now, it was known that this particular mutation occurs quite commonly in a mutational hotspot, what we call, but someone had the knowledge or the thought that it could, could they be related to, in fact, to the Irish giant because they all came from Northern Ireland. So they'd extracted two teeth from the skeleton that resided in the Hunterian Museum. And lo and behold, found that he also carried the, the same mutation. And then, although this paper, because it was really pre-next generation sequencing being sort of routine, they did some other analysis, but the same information could be gleaned from a next generation sequencing process now. But basically, some fancy analysis around that gene confirms that, in fact, they all come from the same family. So further projections, in fact, the ancestor was probably 57 generations ago, up to 3,300 years ago. And the expected number of carriers in one generation is about 68 with a range. And therefore, the number of mutation carriers in the currently living family could be several hundred. Right. So then we look back and there are a whole lot of legends, um, particularly in Northern Ireland, about giants. We've got, if you've been to um, County Antrim in Ireland, there's a boot-looking giant boot. They call the giant boot down here. This is the Giant's Causeway. I actually named the Giant's Causeway, and it's believed that that connected to Scotland um, and was the means by which the giants travelled across. We've got um, Finn McCall, a very famous um, Irish giant, apparently. Um, and then if you've heard the story of David and Goliath, I don't know where they're supposed to come from, but, it, you know, another legend basically where um, Goliath was supposed to have suffered from a, a pituitary giant, a growth hormone secreting pituitary tumour. The reason that he couldn't see David flinging the, whatever, the slingshot thing at him was because he was affected, visual field was affected by his pituitary tumour, so he couldn't see it. David is also supposed to have um, potentially growth hormone deficiency and he was small. <laughs> so, you know, you can go on and on and on, but I suppose my point is that legends may be based in truth. And um, it's all very, very interesting. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.